Uh, thank you guys for being here. And then, first of all, really thank you to Vanessa and everybody involved with Blast. Um, I really appreciate you guys having me here. But I'm just really humbled to stay on the same stage with guys like Kenny and Daniel and Yo and Mike and even be in the same room with Lincoln and everybody from, Stat from Blast. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, and just share a little bit about some of the things that we did within our program. I was a first year coach last year, a first year assistant, full time assistant, um, controlling an offense. I was at Ole Miss for three years as a volunteer assistant before I took the position at Minnesota. Um, and I was very careful and particular about the information that I relayed to our athletes. So I'm going to share a little bit about that. It's not so much about what we did to develop physically, but about a couple of things that we did on the mental side of the game to really propel us to where we were. Um, something that's very um, important to me is having a great swing is one thing, but being a great hitter is something totally different. It's totally different. We can teach a lot of people to have very pretty swings, but when the lights come on at 7 o'clock versus 5 o'clock, sometimes they just can't hit. And we wonder why. Why can't they hit? Why are they not on time? Why can they not be the hitter that I know they are? Um, and a piece of that is what we're going to talk about. But um, when I got to Minnesota, like I said, I was very particular about what I, I relayed to them. Because when I got there, I was, for the juniors and seniors, I was their third hitting coach in three seasons. I was their third hitting coach in three seasons. And in 2017, they won 53 games without me. So I was very, um, I don't know, just meticulous about the information that I relayed. Because they didn't choose me, I chose them. I chose them, I picked them, I picked that program. And so when I came in with a bunch of information, it was up to me to decide what information do they need. And if I come in hot with all kinds of information, I'm going to lose them right there. I'm going to lose them. I'm going to lose everything that they had because all they knew is they were successful without the information that I was bringing to the table. So I had to think a little bit about some things and some things right off the top that I was going to implement. And we had three main core things. Uh, one, the first day of practice, I showed up with our practice plan, and it said Golden Gophers at the top, and in one cor corner it said Big Ten Champions, and in the other corner it said Women's College World Series 2019. And I wish I could show that to you, but my computer got stolen, so I don't have any of my practice plans. So I don't have any of that, but I showed up with that, and they looked at me, and they're like, what are, what are you talking about? You think we're going to go to the World Series this year? You're right, I do. And if we don't start speaking about it right now, then it's never going to happen. So we created a culture where, where our championship communication was something that was very, very important to us. And the three main things that we talked about were intent. We're going to show up every single day with intent and purpose in what we're doing. We're going to show up with accountability. Not only are we going to hold each other accountable physically, but mentally in the way that we hold ourselves, the way we carry ourselves, and we're going to earn it through failure. And the third and the most important thing is ownership. Ownership is the key to the success. It is the key to what made our athletes who they are and is what I believe is what's going to continue success um, through the rest of the time I'm there. So having a great swing, swing is one thing, but being a great hitter is something totally different. So we're going to dive into it. Perfect. Okay, so ownership. And you can click straight into it, Vanessa. A couple of things, own your actions. We were very clear about owning our actions, the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we move, the way we ate, the way we slept, the way we entered the practice facility every single day. We walked in with our chest out, our chin up, and we were very clear about the actions that we wanted our athletes um, to not only do when they were moving, when they were moving their barrel through space, when we were at practice, no matter what it was, we were very clear about their actions were theirs um, and they were not ours and we were gonna own it from the very beginning. Second thing is it's not, a, it's not about how much information you know, it's what can, they can do with it. It doesn't matter how much information I know. It doesn't matter uh, how much potential I see in someone. What matters is how they interpret the information and what they can do with the information when the lights come on. That's the most important thing. Yours versus theirs. The last thing I wanted was for them to feel like they were letting me down in a game whenever they were swinging. The last thing you want is for them to fail at the plate and then come back to the dugout and they felt like they were letting me down because it was the swing that I had built. It's not my swing, it's their swing. So when they were failing or whenever they weren't being successful or doing the things that they wanted to do, I wanted them to feel like they could claim the ownership over it to where they wanted to be better, not just letting me down. That's the last thing I wanted them to feel. So we talked a lot about different things in that area. Self-awareness. Are you a feeler? Are you a thinker? Are you a poolside hitter? Do you slice to the opposite field gap? Do you use your legs? Do you not create enough space with your arms? Are you terrible at the ball middle in? Are you good at the ball middle away? 
can I recognize an off speed? Because recognizing off speed is the biggest thing. Do I have timing issues? Can I create timing? What is timing? Where does it come from? Coach, I'm not on time. What is timing? How do you create it? Do I create it in my core? Biggest thing here, get your foot down early. Get your foot down early. If you're creating timing by getting your foot down, you are never going to be on time. That should not define when we're on time, ever. We decide with our eyes, with our core, with, with information that we've gathered. Being, getting on time in the, in the dugout. You'll see our kids standing on, the, on deck in the dugout beside me. They're just picking their foot up, putting it down. They're figuring out how to get on time in their core. They're picking up release point. They're doing different things that they need to do to figure out how to be on time. I have certain kids that are completely feelers. They have to feel everything. And then some of them have to see me do it. They'll have to see me take swings. They'll have to see their teammates take swings so they can see it and they can replicate it. But some have to always feel it or they'll never figure out how to do it on their own. So it's up to us to figure out how can we individualize each kid, what do they need, and how can I provide the right information for them so then they can act upon it. We wanted to create a culture to where every kid on our team felt self-taught. Did we help build and develop their swings in the fall? Yes. Did we use blasts every single day? And if they showed up to practice without their sensor on, they turned around and walked back. And if they didn't have it with them that day, they didn't come to practice. That's how important it was to us to understand the data that we needed to collect, that I needed to collect, so I could then kind of skim through it and figure out what we needed to do from there. Because I didn't know them. I didn't know them very well. I needed to figure out what I was working with, not only with my eyes, but with the numbers. What are the metrics telling me that I need to work on? So then we can specialize the areas that we need to move forward with. So I wanted to feel self-taught. Not that I taught them, but they taught themselves through failure, through achievement, through success, through different things. Authenticity and style. If you look at our kids, not one of them swing the same. Now it's probably the same from the time they make a decision and they commit to the ball and say yes and finish through the ball, but not one of them starts the same. Not one of them thinks the same. We don't say swing up, we don't say swing down, because I have two that have to think that their shoulders and hips are square to the plate as long as possible so they can stay through the ball to the middle of the field. Then I have two that have to think, oh, I got to get all the way closed and I got to get all the way open. That's how I'm going to hit the ball the farthest. That's what makes them successful. So we don't talk about specific blanket items as an entire staff. We talk about things that they each need to hear. There's three or four starters that cannot hit off machines after Wednesday when we play on Friday because it totally messes them up. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because that's what they need. Now, if they are still performing on Friday night at 7 o'clock when we're in an in-conference series, I'm not worried about how many swings they took off a machine on Wednesday. I'm worried about what they could do in that game, in that given moment, and what helped make them successful. So their style is one thing. I don't get caught up in trying to change style. Natalie Den Hartog was our huge uh, freshman hitter that has a leg kick that gets completely closed with her front side and gets completely back open. But you know what? It works. It works for her. So we can't get caught up in trying to change style as long as it works. There's different things that we can tweak and help make them successful because if you're getting your leg up really, really high and they're blowing 72 past you, then we have to just learn how to control our timing and maybe start a little bit earlier. But we can still operate within our own um, thing that makes us special. Quote, little quote over here. This is one of our players, our freshmen from this year. It's not always about what you see through your lens, but what do they see through theirs? Because I can see things through my lens. And there's some times where the, they start to drag the field and my lens gets dusty. And I have to take it off and, and wipe off my glasses and like, okay, my lens is a little dusty. What are they seeing through their eyes? Because if they don't see it through their eyes, it doesn't matter what I see. So sometimes we have to adjust what they see, what they believe in themselves versus what I believe in them. Next. Next piece. Be careful about your verbiage. Let them identify what is good and bad for themselves early. I told them in the fall, I said, I'm going to stand back here for BP, and I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to say good job after every swing. I'm not going to say that was a bad swing. I'm not going to say anything because I don't want you to define success based on what I think is success. I want you to figure it out for yourself. I want our verbiage to be very clear. When we have a group shagging and we hit a home run 500 foot foul, I don't want everybody to yell, oh, great hit. Well, we didn't get any runs for that. So it's not a great hit. So it was up to me to 
kind of control the temperature and control the verbiage, but I was very clear in the beginning. I didn't say good job. I didn't say bad job. I wanted them to figure out, okay, that probably wasn't a good hit. Maybe it was a good hit in the past, but it's not a good hit now. It didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. What do I need to do to make that feel better? Words have meaning and value. Do they hear you? That's an important one because you go out and you, you hear a lot of people and you watch a lot of games, and especially we've been on the road like crazy, and you hear a lot of people yelling things and yelling and yelling and yelling, and I'm like, they don't hear you. It doesn't matter what you say. You're to a point where they don't hear you. So if they don't hear you, they're not taking in the information, that, therefore they can't get better. And all they're trying to do is to not let you down. So we have to, I'm very crazy about the things that I say to them and what they need to hear and the way I want them to hear it. Because just because I say one thing to you and one thing to you, you both are going to take the same amount of information two totally different ways and it's up to me to figure that out. So I may have to pump some up because they need more confidence where I need to be harder on others. And it's kind of funny where we have a, a br pretty broad recruiting base around and I get to hit with a lot of different athletes and they all take information differently. And I'm starting to think some of it's kind of geographical, like of where, where you're at in um, the US. It's like a little bit different. So it's kind of cool trying to figure that piece out. But what do they hear and what message are they hearing? Belief and trust in what you're telling them. If they don't believe you, and they don't trust the information, it's never gonna help them. So building a trust piece, building a piece of trust so much to where it doesn't matter what you say, they will do anything for you, that's where you have to be. That's where you have to be. They have to believe every piece of information. Everything that you say is in their best interest that's trying to help them be successful. If there's a language barrier there, if there is a failure to be able to communicate on that level, that's going to take you back three or four steps. And then that goes back to they don't hear you. They don't hear you if you have a language barrier or if you have a barrier in your verbiage, in your language that you can't communicate with. So belief and trust is a big one. Ownership is their spark, and we are their resource. We are just a tool. In the spring, I wanted to be a tool that they could come to for information, for help, for guidance. Sometimes it wasn't, hey, you're doing this, you're doing that. You're not in your hips. You're not in your legs. Your hands are dropping. It wasn't that. It was, hey, let's fix our direction. Let's try to go right center a little bit. Stay over the ball a little bit longer. It's not always about this or this or this, and you see people out in recruiting, and they're like, this, 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 this. I'm like, they ain't no problem doing this. There's no problem doing this. There's problem in here. There may be some timing issues. There may be some, ment some mental issues. So it's trying to figure out how can we spark that in them? How can we spark it so much that they want to own it, that they want to be the best that they can be any given day on any given field, and they believe that they can compete with the best any time of the day? How can we do it? Ownership is the piece that I think is the main key, and we are just a resource. Get out of their way so you can see, and I heard that from Lincoln not too long ago. It's my job. I want to build up such a common language that I'm just going to get out of the way. I'm there. I'm their hitting coach. I provide them with the right information. I tell them what they're going to get, um, who we're facing that day, what kind of arm they are. Are they a spin person? Do they have a lot of velo? Do they have downspin? Does the ball have upspin? Um, do they have any tendencies in what they're doing if they want that information? And it's not blanketed information because some people can't hear it. We have a couple that we, we may send out in the hall during scouting report meetings, and that's okay. That's okay. They, it's going to hurt the team if they hear it. So sometimes you just got to send them out. But get out of their way, build them up, build up who they can be, what they're doing, make them believe in their ability so much that you can step back and just let them succeed. Step back and let them do their thing. Let them be who they are. Next one. How we integrated BLAST. So we have been using BLAST for a full year. That was one thing that I was 100% confident in that I was going to take and start whenever I got to Minnesota. Um, it was very important that not only was I going to evaluate swings by my eye, but I wanted to see what was behind the eye, what was behind the body, what are their true power numbers, do we have trouble getting on plane, do we have trouble with our timing, what are we, what are we struggling with as a group, but what are we struggling with as individuals. It helped us create a common language. Uh, our kids started 
like getting really intrigued by blast. What does that mean? What, what do I need to do with that? What, is that saying I have, I'm doing something wrong? Right here, and you're not wrong. You just could improve there. So it sparked a part of their brain that I don't think some of them knew existed. And that's one of the big things that I loved. It got them all together. It rallied them of, hey, don't forget your sensor. It started holding us accountable. Don't forget your sensor. Hey, what are my numbers today? Have I gotten better? Hey, how can I look at my swings after practice? When in the past, maybe they weren't looking at swings after practice. Hey, didn't you say I could watch my swings? Yeah, this is how you reach them. So it wasn't taking the information and, information and dumping it on them. It was letting it engage them and let them nibble at it. We had a couple kids in the fall that they had no idea how to fail because they had never failed. We had a couple kids from Minnesota that had hit like 7'10 in high school. 7'10. That means they're ne almost never failing. So who was I to walk in and say, oh, you're doing all this wrong? They weren't doing nothing wrong, but they needed, they, it, I had to get to a point where they needed me. So I let them, let them do their thing. Let them get against some good arms. Let them ha face Pfizer one or two times and start failing. Then they want, they want information because they need you. When they need you, that's your place to step in. So we created a common language and we learned to earn accountability. We earned it. We earned accountability through failure because without failure, there is no learning. If you're always doing everything right, what are you learning? So we, we earned our accountability through our failure, which led to a learning process, which helped us gain knowledge. And to us, knowledge is always power. Knowledge is always power, and we preach that. The more knowledge that you have, the more power that you have over your opponent, within our organization, within our program. How are we going to earn accountability amongst each other? Uh, we showed intent in practice. The difference between good and great BP is intent. What are you showing up with on any given day? On a Tuesday afternoon, what are you showing up with? What purpose, what intent? We have specific rounds that we do every single day. And some people that hate ground balls would probably come to our practice and be like, why are you guys hitting ground balls? Well, we're working on barrel control. That's what we're doing. We're learning how to hit a ground ball up the middle. Then we're going to spray the field to the opposite field gap. Then we're going to work on hit and runs. We're going to work on run and hit, so when our runner's in motion or when you have to swing but you can drive the ball. We're going to work on a pull side gap. We're going to work on driving the ball. We work on every single bit because that helps make them self-aware. So our first round every day is two sacks, get them over, drive them in, uh, score the run free. Second round. Hard ground balls, hard line drives up the middle. It can be a one skipper in the back of the uh, skin of the infield, or it can be a line drive right back up the middle. Just something low to where we're controlling our barrel, so when we face somebody that's working up all the time, maybe we do think down, and that's okay. So we'll do that. We'll spray the field. We'll hit the ball opposite field. Then we'll work the middle gaps. Then we'll live free. Hey, it's your time. You're a home run hitter. You, you hit them. We have a couple kids that will hit 10 out of 10 over the fence, well over the fence. But... They have to complete their rounds of hitting the ball oppo, hitting the ball back through the middle before they can get to that, because I know they can do that. I know they can do that any given day. That's easy. Just stepping in, dipping and ripping is easy. It's hard to stay over the ball. It's hard to hit the ball the other way with authority. It's hard to control the barrel in a hit and run situation when somebody's throwing 72 up and I'm still calling a hit and run. That's hard. So we practice those things. So we make sure that we show up every day with intent. We gain information from every swing. Not only is the sensor gaining the information so we can go back and evaluate it, but our kids gain information from every swing because the best kids that can gain the most information in the smallest amount of time and make adjustments the quickest will be the most successful. Be, easily be the most successful. So, am I facing a kid with downspin and I swing over the ball? Do I have the ability to recognize that in game that I'm swinging over a ball that's breaking down? So I can make the adjustment right in the middle of the game and I don't have to go back and say, hey, was I swinging over the ball? Yeah, three times. Three times you swung over a ball breaking down. So now we don't have to wait till the next at bat, but they can kind of look in and they'll be like, breaking down? Yeah, breaking down. Okay, now I need to get up underneath it a little bit so I can get back on plane with it, understanding that the ball's breaking down so I can get behind it a little bit, drive it the other way. So what information are we gaining from every swing so we can store it in our little information bank so when things happen in the future, I'm not making the same mistakes over and over and over again, but I've got that information, I've interpreted the information, now what am I going to do with it? Because again, it doesn't matter how much information you know, 
it's what are you doing with the information. And that's a big key piece of it. So it's a couple pictures of our kids. Um, one of our kids, really big open, big top swing. And then this little kid that hit a home run against LSU in Super Regionals, where it was 0-0 ball game. She has hit one home run her whole year. But when she stepped in the batter's box, she believed that she could hit it off the building in left field every single time. And in any given day, the kid with one home run still won enough at the plate because I know she was going to give us the best chance. And if she went down, she was going to go down fighting with her entire team on her back. And that's what you want. That's what you want to breed. doesn't matter if the kid that has one home run, no home runs, or the kid that had 19. What are they bringing? What they, can they offer? And how can we empower them so much to believe that on any given day, they are good enough to be anyone that steps in the circle to face them? Well, how can we do that? Because the one variable that you don't always have in practice that's in the game is there's somebody trying to get you out. So you practice all these things in the cages and they look good and you're wondering, it's like, why can't I be successful in the game? Well, how about that variable right there in the circle that's on 70 up that is trying to get you out every single time? That's the variable that we're forgetting. So how can we build up our kids so much that where they know that they can compete and that does, never fears them, ever? You can go to the next one. Okay. This is the last thing. This is my favorite picture for the entire year. This is in the dugout at the Women's College World Series. And this thinking little flyer that we created, it says, let the lion out, go hunt your dream. And there's a picture of a lion. Bunch of Midwest kids trying to go hunt their dream, trying to get to the Women's College World Series for the first time ever, and how are we going to do it? We got Georgia coming to town. We got LSU coming to town. We have all these great programs that are trying to beat us and showing up and saying, you don't belong. So what are we going to do? We printed out a stinking picture of a lion, and we told our kids that you are that lion. Go hunt your dream. Hunt it. And hunt your dream had so many different things tied into it because that's what we talk about in the game. Are you the hunter or the prey? When the lights come on at 7 p.m., are you the hunter or are you the prey? Because if you're the prey, you will get beat every single time. So you better show up with your chest out and your chin up ready to fight because they're trying to beat you. And what are you bringing to the fight? So go hunt your dream. We didn't always talk about looking outer third, looking inner third. We hunted the middle of the plate like a hunter out there looking for whatever you're trying to go after because pitchers make mistakes, and when they do, we're going to own it every single time. We, we always didn't talk about hunting middle out or hunting middle in because hunting middle out meant we were hunting middle out river, hunting middle out other batter's box at times. So we set our sight in the middle 12 and hunted the middle of the plate, waited on a mistake till somebody proved they could throw a 70 in or 65 in confidently over and over again. We waited on them to make their little mistake. So go hunt your dream. Let the lion out. There were times in the World Series I think I ran up and down the the cage and I rattled the thing. I'm like, let the lion out. Where are you? Come out. And they bought in. They didn't care. They bought in. They weren't afraid of looking dumb because they're, they're vulnerable with each other. They didn't care. When you learn to appreciate the failure, appreciate each other, let everything go out the window. Who cares what anyone else thinks? Who cares that we never made it to the World Series before? Because we were ready. We were ready for our moment. We believed in what we were doing. We used all this information to make us who we were but we were ready for the moment and we believed on any given day that we could be anyone that showed up to beat us. And that's what I believe got us there. And it was all through one key thing, ownership. Now, I believe in everything that everybody got up here to talk about. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to, do to dive into everything. Now, do we develop our swings in the fall? Yes. But in the spring, it's right here. I don't talk about how much angle we're getting. I don't talk about how much depth we're getting. I talk about swing direction. Hey. Maybe you need to get on plane a little bit earlier. Start your process a little bit earlier. Where are you at in your mental space? You feeling good? Not having a good day? How you feel? How can I make you feel better? What do you need from me? What information do you want? That's what the spring's about. Spring's about winning now. Winning now, winning in the moment, making adjustments the fastest, and the different, the good and great players have the ability to do one thing, and it's to let go. People don't stay in the big leagues for a long time if they can't figure out how to let things go. So we teach them different things like that. But we create ownership, and that's what I believe um, makes a lot of people successful. So thank you, guys.